Recently, my wife and I finished painting this sign, and uh, I thought before I put it in use outdoors, I'm actually going to preach a little message. What is the definition of true Christian salvation as found in the Bible, the King James Bible? Down here you see KJV stands for King James Version, all right? Uh, the greatest book that's ever been written. Uh, anybody that knows anything about literature will understand that I'm speaking the truth on that. Uh, regardless of your prejudices or whatever else, the King James Version of the Bible, this book I hold in my hands, was first printed in 1611, and it has been in print ever since then. Uh, not too many books can hold to that kind of a claim. But I want to talk to you today about what is true biblical salvation. What makes you truly a Christian? And uh, I'm going to tell you right up front what it's not, and then what it is, and then we're going to get into the scriptures. All right. First of all, true biblical Christianity, salvation that gets you to heaven, is not going to church. That practice appears nowhere in the pages of the King James Bible. Not one Christian ever went to a building called a church. That practice came a long time after that. It is completely pagan in its origin. Completely. Uh, number two, salvation is not being part of a certain denomination. Again, there are no denominations in this book. Nobody's going around calling themselves a Roman Catholic or a Baptist or a Presbyterian or an Episcopalian or a Lutheran or whatever. Completely foreign to Scripture. Number three, salvation is not giving 10% of your income to an incorporated building to pay off their mortgage and so that the pastor can live high on the hog and have a nice house and everything else while you live in a small place. That's not salvation, according to the King James Bible. You won't find it in there. All right, There is no 10% required tithe in the pages of the King James Bible. Number four, there is no Sunday best, special uniforms. Nobody in the New Testament wears a special uniform. Suit and a tie, wife in her Sunday best dress. Not anywhere in the pages of the King James Bible. And yet a lot of you think that that is true Christianity. It's not. You say, what is true Christianity? True Christianity is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And true Christianity is following this book in all matters of faith and practice. And not lying about it like a lot of the Babel building people out there, the people that go to churches. We call them Babel buildings because that's all those things are. They're social clubs. You go there to talk and gossip and, uh, you know, spread around some juicy little tidbits of information about people in your community. That's all they are. There's no basis for those things in the entire New Testament. None at all. This book defines what we believe as Bible-believing Christians. So now let's get into this thing here. Let's look at this verse. This is found in Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Now you will notice a Bible-believing preacher will point you to the Word of God. They'll point you to this book. I encourage you to read this book for yourself. You see, I am bound to the standards of this book. I can't all of a sudden switch gears and say, Hey, you know what? God just gave me this special revelation that all of you are supposed to send me $1,000. Because all you'd have to do is just look up and say, The Bible says, Beware of covetousness, for man's life abideth not... Or, for man's life um, consisteth not, excuse me, consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. You could nail me on it. And I'd have to say, oh yeah, you're right, that, that's what the Bible says. See, that's the difference. That's the, that's the thing that separates Bible-believing Christians from everybody else. We have a standard. We hold to a standard. You see? That's what true Christianity is. True Christianity is not church traditions and fathers, uh, church fathers and things like this and the hierarchy of the Pope coming on down through telling you what to do and it's okay that his priests are raping your children. That's not true Christianity. Let's look at what it is. Mark chapter 2 verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Very important word. This is true Christianity right here. All right. This defines people that get saved and people that remain lost and in their dead 
self-righteousness. You see, there are two ways to approach God. The first one is, they that are whole, these people are the ones that Jesus calls right down here, I came not to call the righteous, you see? These people up here, they're whole. They don't think that there's anything wrong with them. You say to them, you say, uh, if you die tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? Well, I think I'd go to heaven. Why? I'm a pretty good person. I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. I've never, and on and on and on. You know what's wrong with them? In their minds, they're whole. But that's not reality. Let me show you. You can look in the book of Romans. Again, I'm telling you to look something up in this book. You see, I'm holding you to a standard. I'm holding myself to a standard. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. That's what the Lord thinks about you. You see, Jesus is speaking somewhat in jest here. He's speaking sarcastically. The Lord Jesus Christ was often very sarcastic. Again, most professing Christians hate that sarcastic Jesus Christ of this Bible that appears in this Bible. The Jesus that appears in this book right here is foreign to the average professing Christian. They don't know him. But you see, Jesus is speaking sarcastically. He says, they that are whole have no need of the physician. Now, is there anybody out there that is completely healthy? that has no need of a physician or has no need of any kind of uh, healing types of things? Of course not. Jesus knew what he was talking about. He's speaking sarcastically here. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Does that mean that there are some people that don't need to get saved? Well, of course not. What Jesus is saying here is people that think that they are whole, they don't think that they, if there's anything wrong with them. They're, I'm a good person. See, they're the ones that think that they're righteous but they're self-righteous. They have no righteousness that comes from Jesus. They have no righteousness that comes from God. It's self-righteousness. So you can't call me, oh, you're just so self-righteous. Oh no, you see, because I realize that I am sick. I realized that a long time ago and I looked for the physician, you see? You say, who's the physician? What, what, what doctor did you go to? Well, the one that made me. I went to the very creator. I went to his instruction manual for me. I went to his book to see how I could have a cure for my sin problem. You see, anything that will make you sick, genuinely sick, is sin. All sins lead to sickness and ultimately to your death. Let me show you that. Romans chapter 6 Verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What you earn are wages. When you mess around and mess around and mess around, you start drinking alcohol, and you drink and you drink and you drink, and it's not just a, hey, I drink once a year or something or whatever, and I'm not justifying that even. What I'm saying is, you know, you, you start to drink and it starts to turn into alcoholism and alcohol abuse. And now you become a drunkard, which is what the Bible condemns, drunkenness. All of a sudden now, you have a problem. Your sin has earned you the wages of death. I recently just had a neighbor, a Roman Catholic neighbor, that died because of a life of drunkenness. He ruined his health. Yeah, all sin is negative, every single bit of it. And the smart person will come to the point where they will see, I need the physician. I need the creator. I am sick of these sins. I'm sick of my life. I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. I'm in despair. I'm in debt. I have problems. I need to find the physician. I need to find who it is that made me. I need the answers. You see? Those are the people that admit to being sick. They're honest enough to come and look for the physician. And those sinners that are sick, 
that see the physician come to repentance. That's true salvation right there. Anybody that tells you that repentance has no part of your salvation is a false convert. Mark it down. Listen to me. What good would a physician be if they told you the cure for your sickness and it didn't change your life? They wouldn't be any good at all. You go to the doctor, you say, doctor, I have a high fever and, and I have a sore throat. I can, I can barely swallow and I, I, I got bumps on my arms and things like this. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And the doctor says, well, take these pills. And you take them and uh, you get worse. And you go to another doctor and you say, I, I'm worse off. I got, I got all these other problems. And the doctor says, oh, try this. And you try it and you get worse. What are you going to do? You're going to keep looking until you find the right physician. You see? That's what's going on here. And what happens is you get a lot of people that say, I'm going to come to Jesus, but I'm, going to, I'm not exactly sick. You see? I have some things in my life that uh, I don't want to give up. I'm, uh, after all, a pretty good person, you know? Right here? A pretty righteous person. So I'm going to come to Jesus and I'm going to keep certain things because I'm not that bad. They're not willing to give up their sinful life. You see, when you come to the physician, he says, I can only heal you if you're willing to do what I tell you to do. You see? I mean, if you go to the physician and he says, yes, I can genuinely heal you, it's going to mean diet change. I'm going to have to do some adjustments on you, chiropractic type of things, and, and uh, we're going to have to give you some natural health types of things and stuff like that. I mean, prescription drugs, I'm not even going to go there. But and you go to that physician and he says, these are the lifestyle changes that you must take if you want to be well. Uh, yeah, no, just cure me another way. I don't, I don't want to change my life. Uh, it's not going to happen. Any physician that's worth anything is going to tell you if you're sick and perpetually sick with that same thing, you need to have a new life. You need to change some things. That's a good physician. But let me show you here. Very interesting thing. Let's actually go to the passage. Mark chapter 2. Let's get into context here of what's going on in Mark 2.17. And that's another thing. You've got to you know, read along in a King James Bible. If you don't have one, you can actually go pause this video and go on uh, BibleGateway.com, I think is one site. Uh, you can look up free King James Bible online and you can look up the, these scriptures and follow along as I'm telling you these things to make sure I'm not lying to you. That's important. Mark chapter 2, verse 15 says, And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Hmm. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with, the pub with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Now look at the context of that. Publicans and sinners versus Pharisees there. Scribes and Pharisees. Verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, who's he talking about there? The righteous are the religious crowd, the scribes and Pharisees. Those that are sick are the sinners, the publicans and sinners. They are the ones that are there to see the physician. You see? You see how that works? And they didn't come and say, Hey, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but you know what? I don't care what you want to do here. I just want to be have you acknowledge the fact that I'm a sinner, and I want to be going to heaven when I die. And so you just do that, and I don't want to change my life. Uh-uh. They came to the physician. Why? Because they realized they had a sin problem. They were sick. Know what I mean? They were sick. Don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that you can somehow be saved. You come to the physician, you're saved by Jesus Christ, and yet you go on living in your sin. I didn't say that you're never going to mess up as a Christian. Of course you'll mess up. 
You see, those men that were sitting with him were publicans and sinners, and they were sitting with Jesus. They were in fellowship with Jesus. All right? Don't think that if you find the right physician when you're sick, don't think that your cure is just going to be instantaneous and you'll never get sick again. Oh, no, that doesn't happen. I myself have struggled with headaches for years and years and years. And you know what? I'm still looking for the cure. You say, well, I thought you were cured. Well, it's a lifestyle change. You see? I have to change certain things about my diet, certain things about uh, whatever. You know, there's a lot of things that go into this, this thing of, of finding ways to be healthy. All right? It's a lifestyle change. I don't just say, I'm going to go to the physician whenever I'm sick and have him just give me something and I'm better. No, it's a changed life that happens. And so it is with your salvation. Repentance. Repentance, the word repentance is defined by the context, by the verse in which it appears. There are many different ways to define this word right here. Repentance encompasses many, many things. You see, one of the biggest knocks to a man's pride and if you're a man, you know exactly what I'm talking about, is to have to admit that you're sick. Boy, that's embarrassing. I mean, maybe some men out there doesn't bother them, but I know it bothers me. I have to be in really bad shape before I admit to being sick, before I will ask for help for some sick condition that I have, even of my own wife. You know, I have to be very, very sick. But you see, that repentant state where you finally are broken, where you finally say, I need to have my mind changed about my condition. I can't just say, I'm whole. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I'm okay. Everything's okay. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. No, you have to come to the place where you realize you're sick. You see? You realize that you're sick. You change your mind. And you say, well, then that just means change mind. Oh, no, it means a lot more than that. You see? You change your mind. You say, I'm no longer whole. I'm sick. I need the physician. You see, my mind changed about my condition, but now my mind also changed about my righteousness. I can't save myself. You see, Jesus is using the analogy of people that are whole and people that are sick, but he's, he's comparing it to spiritual things, the spiritual realm. People that think that they are righteous, the self-righteous, the churchgoers, the false religion crowd, those people there... They think that they're whole. They don't believe that they have a sick problem, a sickness problem. Those of us that have repented, that have repented, we realize, hey, we have a sin problem. We need the physician. We're repenting. Right? I am not righteous of myself. I cannot say I can earn my way to heaven by being a good person. I can't. So I have to change my mind and I have to say, I didn't believe that Jesus Christ could heal me. I didn't believe that he was my savior. But now I'm repenting. I'm changing my attitude. I'm changing my mind. And I have a, a different attitude about my sin now. I understand that I'm sick. You see? And so then this repentance leads me to salvation. Let me show you the difference. 2 Corinthians. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You see, when you have godly sorrow, when you realize that you are a sinner, you will repent before God. You will come in a repentant state, a broken state, and say, God, I'm sorry for these bad things that I've done. I'm sorry for those sins that I committed that made me sick, that put me into this condition. And I know that I can never be righteous in your sight. Your word says there's none good. There's none righteous. I can't ever please you with my life. So what I have to do is I have to put my faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's having godly sorrow. Knowing, hey, the people I've stolen from, the people that I've lied to, the people that I've wronged, I have to answer to those people. That's true. I've wronged those people. That's true. But the real person that I've wronged, the real man I've wronged is God Almighty. And my only chance is what Jesus did on the cross to pay for my sins. I need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, repentance encomp encompasses a lot of things. 
And let me show you a verse about the thing of a changed life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, notice it is a condition. If you are in Christ, what does in Christ mean? That means you are a Christian. All right? Uh, I used to live in uh, the state of Pennsylvania. So I was a Pennsylvanian. You see? It's relating you to something. All right? To be in Christ makes you a Christian. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, behold, all things are become new. Did you ever see somebody that struggled with sickness for years and years and years? And you think to yourself, boy, they're going to be dead soon. Poor thing. I just, you know, there's nothing they can do, I guess, for them. They're just kind of a lost cause. And then you see them a while later, and there they are, and they're healthy, and they look great and everything. You say, what happened? Well, I tried this new cure, and it worked great. And my whole life changed. Don't tell me that you can come to Jesus Christ as a sick sinner looking for Jesus as your physician, and yet there's no change. Don't tell me that. Don't even tell me that. You see, the people that want to do that, they say, I've gone to the doctor, but I'm not that bad. You see, I'm whole. I'm righteous, self-righteous. The doctor says, if you want to live any longer, you're going to have to give up whatever. And they say, oh, sure, doctor. Yeah, sure, 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 doctor. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And they go right back to drinking or smoking or doing drugs or whatever else. You see, that's what a lot of religious people do. They see themselves as being whole. Well, yeah, I mean, we're all sick at some point in time, but I'm not a bad person. You see, they have no desire to change their life. They don't truly come in that sick situation being a sinner that needs to repent. They don't do that. You say, well, what should I do? I have a sick problem. I have a, I have a sickness problem. I have some issues that I need to take care of. Well, let's go to one of the, probably the most famous verse of Scripture in the entire King James Bible, the one that's most well known. A lot of people will turn you to. John chapter 3, verse 16. It says here, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, see, God loves me. That's not what it says. For God so loved the world. You see, is loved present tense or past tense? Past tense. He did it once. How do you know? That he gave one time his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have ever, everlasting life. It happened once, you see, one time. Jesus died once for sins. That's why when he died on the cross, he said, It is finished. But you go to some Roman Catholic building there, church, they call it on a church. You go there and the priest says, come forward, confess your sins to me in the little booth, and then I'll put this little wafer on your tongue and you can drink some wine and you'll be forgiven for a few minutes and then you have to come back and you have to come back and you have to come back. You see, the church buildings are used to keep people in bondage. You say, oh, you mean Roman Catholic? I mean any of them. Any church building is there to keep you in bondage to the pastor. They want your money. Now, a lot of you have enough sense to realize that, don't you? A lot of you out there have been out there in, in the world and going to some of these buildings and things. You know they're after your money. You're a figure. That's what you are. That's not true biblical salvation. But let's keep reading. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You say, well, then see, Jesus loves me. I don't have to worry about it. Keep reading. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Did you know that you are condemned as soon as you reject Jesus Christ? The Bible in another place calls you a child of disobedience. The wrath of God abideth on the children of disobedience, it says. You see, when you meet up with the physician and he says, Hey, those things that you've done in your life... 
They've made you sick. There's none righteous. They're all going out of the way. The wages of sin is death, you see. Your self-righteousness isn't going to do it. And when you come before Jesus and you get judged like that, He's not judging you to condemn you to the fires of hell for eternity. That's up to you. Jesus Christ has never sent anybody to hell that didn't send themselves there. Why? We just read it. John 3.16 God loved the world enough to let His Son die in your place. Will you accept Him? Will you come with true honesty before God the Father and say, I'm sick of this sinful life. I want to change. You see? I'm a sinner. I'm not whole. I'm not self-righteous. I need my physician, Jesus Christ. Will you accept Him? You say, well, I don't want to go to church. Good, don't go to church. I don't want to wear my Sunday best. I don't want to have to give 10%. I don't want to have to on and on and on. Well, you know what you do? You get yourself a King James Bible, and if you look it up there, and it's not in there, then you don't do it. And God's not going to condemn you. You're not ever going to have to stand before God, and He's going to say, hey, you should have gone to church. You should have worn your tie and suit and everything there. whatever." He's not going to condemn you for what's not written in His Word. This book is going to be the standard that you're judged by someday. Right there. If you speak English, that's the one. And there are many other translations out there that match up with this King James Bible. And of course, Rome has their corrupt versions too, but that's another story. But let's just see a couple other scriptures here and then we're done. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here you have the Apostle Paul writing to the believers in Corinth. And he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You see? The ones that are whole, the ones that are self-righteous, they believe in vain. They don't come and say, I'm sick and I need the physician. They don't see themselves as being sick. What is the gospel? Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He died for your sins. Will you admit to being a sinner? And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's what separates Christianity from Islam or Buddhism or Roman Catholicism or any other false cult out there. That's what makes it different. You see, what did Allah do for you if you're Islamic? And you say, well, he showed me that. No, 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 no. I mean, you personally... Did Allah send His Son to die for your sins? I saw a Muslim the one time, some Muslim cleric, and he said, he said, uh, I don't understand, you know, this thing of Jesus being killed. I wouldn't do that to my son. Yeah, because you're not God. You're awfully stupid if you think that you are. You're not God. God looks down and He sees that there are people that need a physician. He sees people that are sick because they're sinners. And they want repentance. Their self-righteousness is broken. They understand that they're not whole. You see what I'm, what I'm talking about? Allah never did anything for you. Muhammad never did anything for you. No Pope ever did anything for you if you're a Roman Catholic. And you see, this doesn't work for you if you're a Roman Catholic. Because Jesus must be continually sacrificed and you have to continually keep yourself subservient to the greatest bunch of pedophiles out there. It's the truth. What about Buddhism? Buddhism, Hinduism, any of the other things. Where are the founders of those religions? Dead and in the ground. Only one man ever came up. Death had no power over him. The Lord Jesus Christ, He died to take away our sins. Your sins are paid for at the cross if you accept that payment. 
You say, well, I'm not a bad person. Okay, then pay for your own sins. And you know where you're going to pay for them? Straight down in the fires of hell. And then going into eternity in the lake of fire. And you'll burn and you'll burn and you'll burn and you'll never burn up. Because you see, God will give you a body that is eternal. The flesh that you have right now could burn up in a car accident. All these big fires going on in Canada, right now, Alberta, I think it is, and all these huge fires going on out there. You know what? If somebody gets trapped in that, their body's going to burn to a crisp. They might find a few teeth or something like that. You know, you hear some of that. But uh, we're not dealing with that in eternity. In eternity, you're dealing with an immortal body that feels pain and will burn forever. You see, I don't believe that. Let me show you. Romans chapter, excuse me, Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 10. We'll start there. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. This is a future event that's going to happen not too far off in the future where people are taking a mark to buy and sell. You can read about that in Revelation 13. You can read about that thing. But you see there, people burning forever and ever. Let me show you something else. Again, a lot of these preachers that are uh, whole, you know, the ones that are righteous like the scribes and Pharisees in this passage right here in the, in the book of Mark chapter 2, a lot of those preachers are going to be going to hell and so they're trying to decorate hell, hell and make it look like a nice place and it's just burning and then you're out, you know, it's separation from God and that's it and you, you're burned up in an hour or two or whatever. They're saying that because that's where they're going for eternity. They're living in denial. Okay, Revelation chapter 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that had wor or them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So you have the beast and the false prophet cast into this lake of fire. Okay. Then you go to the next chapter, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And if you look at verse 7 there, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So in other words, the beast and the false prophet have been in hell for 1,000 years and they're still burning. And I've done studies on hell. It's a very, very, very frightful place. That's why Jesus talked about plucking out your eye, cutting off your hand to avoid going to hell. It's better to go into life halt and maimed than to go into hell, into the fire that shall not be quenched. Yeah, Jesus warned about it. It's a terrible, terrible place to go to. Let me show you who goes. Revelation 20, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, it's been very well said. Jesus Christ spoke more about hell than anybody else in the New Testament. And that's true. Jesus warned about hell time and time and time and time again. You say, well, I don't understand why a loving God would uh, send somebody to hell. That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, let's look who hell was created for. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not created for man. It was created for the devil and his angels. The devil, the man who is causing this evil in the world. He is the God of this world, lowercase g. He has been given dominion right now in this time. God created hell for him. And if you go to hell, it's going to be because you believe yourself to be whole and trust in your own righteousness. You see? You see how simple salvation is? Salvation is very, very easy. And you know, a lot of people will come out and they'll say of this crowd here, the righteous people, the ones that think that they are whole, they'll come out and they'll tell you, don't worry about repentance. 
salvation is not that important. It's, it's not a big deal to, to think about sin and things like this and to judge sin and whatever. Salvation is the most important thing that you can do in this life. Nothing is more important than you figuring out where you're going to go for eternity. There's not one thing that's more important than that. Finally, let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. We'll start there. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. You're looking at it. The word of God right there on this sign. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know what the wonderful thing is about coming to a real physician? You're no longer ashamed of your uh, sickness. You know why? Because now you understand what the cure is. You've been to the doctor, the real doctor. You've been to the physician. You've gotten to that repentant state, that state of being broken and saying, I'm a sinner. You see? You're not ashamed anymore of those sins because now you understand you've been cured. You see? It's a wonderful thing. Verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. You see, there was a big division back there in the first century between Jews and Greeks. Jews and Gentiles, essentially, be another way that you could say it. Well, you know what? The Bible says God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter what you've done. You know, there's a, the, another scripture that talks about that, that God is eventually going to judge your secret thoughts. Everything is going to be judged. Unless, unless you come to God as a sinner in a repentant state. That's how you get Jesus to forgive you, Jesus to heal you as the physician. That's how it happens. And you don't have to say, well, I don't think I'm worthy because Jesus is a Jew, and he was, but I'm a Gentile. How can I, as a Gentile, come to a Jewish Savior? We just read it there. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Let's read the next verse, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be saved or possibly whatever. Shall be saved. This is a physician that there's no waiting line. There's no coming into his office and taking a number. There's no appointment needed to come and see this physician. He's available all the time. All you have to do is come to him in the right state of mind. You know what I mean? Lower the pride and say, you know what? I have a problem. I'm sick. I'm a sinner. You say, well, how do I know for sure that I'm a sinner in God's sight? You mean you don't know? <laughs> you mean to tell me that uh, you haven't been fed up with this world yet? That's another reason a lot of people don't get saved. They say, well, I'd just like to have a few more parties. I'd like to get a, drunk a few more times. I'd like to fornicate with a few different other partners. You know, they're not sick yet enough. They still think that they still have some health left, you know, still whole enough that they don't need to worry about sickness and going to see the physician. You better get right with God. You better call upon the name of the Lord. You better break down that self-righteous pride and come in repentance. Change your mind about your life. Change your direction. There are a lot of different ways that you can go through this word right there. But this is a beautiful word. It's a beautiful thing to come to the Lord as a sick sinner. And when you come in that situation, He'll heal you. 
First of all, he'll forgive your sins and then he'll give you a new life. I'm living proof of it. You know, for years and years and years, I was up in this crowd right here. I thought to myself, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm a pretty good guy. I was raised in church, all that other stuff. I was very uh, righteous. I didn't do a lot of the wicked things that my friends did, but uh, I did other wicked things that uh, people just didn't need to know about. And God didn't need to know about it. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible talks about the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He knows what you're doing. You see, Jesus as your physician, He knows all about your health. He has your entire past laid out before Him. He's ready to heal you. All you got to do is come to Him. Come to Him in honesty and say, I'm a sinner. I'm here because I want to change life. I'm here because I know I can't save myself. That's what salvation is. You say, well, uh, but I don't think anybody can know for sure. This is where we're going to end it. And there's a lot of confusion out there today about what constitutes true biblical salvation. That's why I'm taking some time here to run you through some scriptures. And we have a salvation message at our main channel page. You can watch it, see even more scriptures. But let's end here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Right there. We're going to see it. You see there, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. You know, if I went to a doctor and I said I'm sick, and that doctor healed me, I'd say, I have a personal witness that I can testify. That doctor knows what he's talking about. And I'll tell you what, back, would it be 15, yeah, 15 years ago now, 15 years ago, I truly came to the physician and I said, I'm sick. I have a sin problem and I have no way of stopping this thing. I don't know for sure if I'm going to heaven when I die. I am a sinner. I came in repentance and he saved me. Jesus Christ, my physician, he saved me genuinely saved me and my life changed. I have the witness in myself because I came as a sinner in repentance. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. The whole person does believe in Jesus because he's self-righteous. I'm not that bad. I'm a good person as we've been saying all through this study. You see how it works? You see how simple it is? It's not hard. It's not difficult. Verse 11, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. That's where your healing comes in at. Right there. <clears throat> he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You say, well, now wait a second here, because you see, I'm a Jew, I'm a chosen I'm of the chosen nation of Israel. Uh, do you have Jesus? You say, uh, well, no, we don't trust him as our Messiah. Then you don't have life. You have death. Hey, what can Judaism do to take away sin? Where's the sacrifice that takes away sin, that promises eternal life? You have none if you're Jewish. Verse 13, these things have I written, you get it? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, right there, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Here is salvation. He is the physician. If you are sick, you're a sinner. You come to Him in repentance. That is salvation. That is true biblical salvation. You have a standard in this book. If it's in it, you do it. If it's not in it, you stop it. 
And you don't let anybody judge you and say, you should be going to church. You should be wearing Sunday best. You should be tithing 10%. You should be submitting to the will of the Pope. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. None of those things are true biblical Christianity. If you are trusting in any of those things, if you are trust, trusting in church membership someplace, you got to get out of those things. They're pagan buildings. They have no basis in Scripture. If you are trusting in your Roman Catholic citizenship, membership, you know, same thing, uh, you're not saved. They say, well, you know, the Catholic Church is, is founded upon, you know, Jesus Christ and St. Peter and things like that. Then why is the word Catholic not in there? Why is there no Pope in here? Why is there no sacrament, the word sacrament? Why are there no nuns? Why are there no monks, monasteries, cathedrals, transubstantiation, Eucharist, on and on and on and on and on? Because it's not true biblical salvation. This verse defines what salvation is all about. Okay, so if you want to get saved, then I suggest you come to the Lord, understand that you're sick over there, you're a sinner, and you need to repent right there. And don't let anybody tell you from this crowd here, don't let anybody tell you you're not that bad of a person, you don't have to repent, you don't have to have a new life, you don't have to change things, there's no change that's required with salvation. I mean, who wants to go to a physician and not come out with a changed life? You see? You're going to go to that physician expecting to have a changed life. And if you don't have a changed life from the physician, then you say the guy's a quack. He's no good. He's no different than anybody else. You have the witness in yourself when you get saved. My life changed. I can testify to the healing power of Jesus Christ. You better get saved. You know, I've been preaching for quite a few years now, and uh, both online and offline, and uh, I'm, I'm convinced. Um, this is the real formula right here. There's a lot of scriptures that talk about salvation and the right way of salvation. A lot of people fight back and forth, but you know, this is the key to it right here. And we wanted to make this sign to be able to witness to people. And it was like, which, which verse would be best? to put on here to witness to people. And we talked about it, we prayed about it. This is the verse right here. That's the most important one, I believe. So, enough said. Uh, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off any longer. Because as soon as you put it off, you're a child of disobedience. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You need to be saved through Jesus Christ. Any other way is going to land you in hell forever. Get saved today.